<clears throat> Hello, welcome to the July 25th, 2023 Club Cubase livestream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream today. Um, if you've not attended a live stream before, how it works is you can ask live questions in the chat field or questions can be submitted in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Uh, when asking questions, if you could specify which version of Cubase that you are using, um, whether it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, or other Steinberg programs, which version number, so if it's 11, 12, 10, 5, 10, etc. Also, if you could specify which operating system that you're using, that's, all, that's also helpful most of the time. Um, when asking questions, realize that my ability to answer questions in a real-time uh, format may soon be eclipsed. Um, so um, if we could try to um, not repeat the same question if you don't see an immediate response to a question, uh, that would be appreciated. It just kind of slows down the whole process, and uh, that way we get through more questions. We should have an index of all the topics discussed on today's live stream. Um, pinned to the top of the comments field several hours after the live stream ends I have to basically rewatch the live stream and type up all the questions with the timestamp so you could use it as a reference source if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams you could go to uh, cubaseindex.com and we want to thank Jan from Stockholm for creating the website and you could search through over 27,000 different topics uh, on the live stream also, uh, we want to give special thanks out to two people that serve as moderators. They're not Steinberg employees. They just do it to make it a better community. So we'll give special thanks to Jazz Dude and to Agent K for their help in moderation uh, when needed. We also will give a special shout out to Jazz Dude for his work with the Cubase Nation Discord, which is a great uh, reference information for... Uh, you know, for the Steinberg community and getting your computer optimized for DAWs and different tutorials and a great resource. Um, so once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America, which is the United States distributor of uh, Steinberg products. And I'm the host and I'm uh, presenting from the United States just outside of Washington, D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. And if you're watching this live, or if you're watching it on a replay, please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. It's fascinating to see people from all over the world. Uh, Friday's live stream will be our last live stream of the month. So just a quick housekeeping note. Um, usually the last live stream of the month, we will have a Zoom meetup. So we go usually for about um, two hours and then migrate over to a Zoom meetup. So, and it's just a, a wonderful, little forum to check in with people and meet people that attend the live streams and and be able to socialize a little bit so i always look forward to that and if you want a link to it i have the meeting set up uh if you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de or we will provide the link in friday's live stream as well so with that we will go ahead and get started with questions all right first question is from julian um says hello i'm having a problem with halion 7 previously i'm using halion 6 and accidentally installing halion 7 already uninstalling halion 7 and install halion 6 but the halion 7 keep appear on cubase um so maybe if you didn't have a license for halion 7s maybe what it sounds like so i'm not sure if you purchased a license or you just installed halion 7 um, if you just accidentally installed Halion 7 and then you're getting kind of a license prompt, uh, probably what you need to do is you'll have a little program and you have it open the Steinberg Activation Manager. So maybe at this point, if you go to the Steinberg Activation Manager, because Halion 6 is on eLicenser, Halion 7 is on new Steinberg licensing, you could at this point just choose to de you know make sure that you check the activation status of it and you could deactivate it here. And I think if it's deactivated, you might be able to also remove 
uh, directly from here. But if it's just like when you're starting up Cubase that you get like a how in seven isn't found kind of message at that point, check the uh, Steinberg activation manager and this utility is installed with uh, Cubase or, you know, or it's going to be installed if you accidentally installed Howling in 7 and see if you could choose to deactivate the license or remove the license uh, directly from here. So give that a shot and let us know if you have a Howling in 7 license or you just kind of rolled it back. If you rolled it back, if you if you didn't have a license and installed it, you may just have to deactivate it. Uh, and then if you wanted to go back to Howling in 6 at that point, it's going to require the e-licensor to be connected on your system. All right. So we have uh, Schumvanda saying hello. We have Arnold saying hello to, to everyone from Germany. Okay, so we have a question from Mozizo11. Uh, his question is, uh, or the question is, uh, hello, Greg, uh, and all in here. Uh, question about Groove Agent. Is there an option to double half the speed of a groove when synced with Cubase with a push of a button? I couldn't find any. Okay, so let's say we have a Groove Agent up in our uh, program here. So let's say we have kind of a groove going on. So if you go into the style grooves and generally the style grooves we have you know endings or fills endings and usually we have intros and then for the most part the middle eight that are yellow will be kind of style grooves and if we select the pattern and then at this point we could just click on uh, edit you can see that there is a half time button so let's say I'll make this kind of more complex. And I want this to go in half time. I could just click right here in this button. And I will take that off. So let's say even if we do a more simple pattern and So you could just click on the half button and if you wanted to have this be learned by a MIDI CC, you could right click on a parameter and you know learn a MIDI CC so you can move a knob here. Uh, and then so as soon as I come here, we'll learn our CC. And now once we have the pattern selected that you could just kind of turn it on and off by the CC message if you wanted to. So I'll just forget CC and we'll learn. And then you could do that, but just look for the half time button. And then you could go to like a half time feel for the style pads. So let me know if that's helpful for you. All right, so we have uh, Taylor from Music for World Peace Records, uh, and he has a feature request. Um, have a chord assistant that can tell you all the possible chords that could be played on a single note or group of notes with complexity selections. Um, you know, I, I could see maybe, you know, if you wanted to, you know, so I, I understand the feature request, but let's just come over here and so let's say if we go to our chord track, and we want to enter in a chord and we have MIDI input selected, you know, so say I play an F chord and then if I just hit other notes, you know, the it can just automatically you know, so if I play different notes randomly here that it will tell you the chord. It's not going to necessarily suggest the chord. So, I mean, if you, um, you know, play a single G, uh, it may not suggest every possible chord. I'm not sure if that would be so practical. You know, every single chord that could include a G, but if you just kind of play the particular notes, and then if you add different notes, let's say I'm playing G major chord and I add a C, you know, we could now just turn that into an 11th chord, 
so you know we could do and so whatever notes you have it can automatically just tell you as you just randomly lay your fingers on a keyboard it could randomly tell you the chords right there so maybe just play the chord but i'll i'll make sure to kind of pass it along as a feature request regardless and it's great to see you on taylor from pine grove pennsylvania always have such fond memories of pine grove going there for our halloween parades with my aunt who lived kind of a town or two over in schuylkill haven so always brings a smile to my face to see pine grove all right wonderful to see uh jazz dude on we have uh toman saying hello to everyone we have benny from sweden we have uh, Brian Sawyer Sr. checking in from Beulahville, North Carolina. Great to have you on. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, uh, from this question from Lars. Uh, sometimes automation tracks are turned on, get turned off after closing slash restarting the project. Um, so we could just let, let me just see if I could create that. So I'll just do a new project here. I'll we'll add an audio track. All right, I'll open up some automation lanes. All right, so let's say we want to do volume panning and we'll add or mute and let's do just pre-gain here all right and i'm going to close this automation lane here Okay, so, and okay, so we'll go ahead and save this. Uh, so save as, and let me just put it into Okay, so we save that, we'll close the project. And now let's reopen the project and we'll see if the automation status is retained with the project. <clears throat> so it looks like that was retained, but if you have projects that you notice it consistently kind of not saving the status of the automation lanes. Um, I don't recall it ever doing that, but if you have a particular project that you find that it's doing consistently, um, please feel please feel free to share the project to me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. All right, um, so we just see question number two. Um, is there a gain plugin in Cubase? So, you know, every track itself has pre-gain. Um, and if you wanted to just increase gain without, um, like, in the middle of, like, an insert chain, you could just come over. So let's say, okay, I have a, a delay and I have, let's say, maybe a filter and I needed to get more gain you know, in between those two, all you'd have to do is you could just, you know, go to even um, the studio EQ and a number of plugins have gain adjustment without applying any processing stage. So, but a lot of people will use a gain plugin um, because they don't have like a channel gain. So, but if you needed it in the middle, so there isn't a plugin that just adds gain, but there's the EQs and compressors can add gain without the EQ being engaged or without the compression being engaged. So 
Let me know if that's helpful. All right. Okay, so we see a question from Dallas LaRue. Uh, it says, I tried to open in Cubase 12, just like you said, but it always opens in Cubase 10. Even when I tried to import it into Cubase 12, uh, Cubase 10 opens. Um, could it be something in the previous profile settings? So, you know, um, and I think this is maybe a follow-up to a question from maybe last week's live stream. So if you have uh, a number of different projects here so let's come over and you know where you could choose which program by default opens it so i'm not sure if you're you know if you're double clicking on the project file itself or if you're just opening you know i don't know if you've tried just to go like once you're in cubase 12 just to open a particular project then it's not going to go into cubase 10 um, but these file associations are kind of done at the operating system level so you know you would just have to change it in the particular operating system um, and it's kind of outside of cubase you know depending on what your mac or mac os or windows is set up to to launch for the file extension all right, wonderful to see Matt Elston on from London. Okay, we see Michael Pierce is going to be dropping in and out. Uh, we see Patrick Becker saying hello to everyone. All right, we have the artist known as Love saying hello to everyone and hoping that everyone is safe. And he says, hit the like button when you can, please. Yes, yeah, so if you do the new learn a new tip or trick, uh, make sure you do hit the like button. All right, and we have Eric Sommer just checking in from Tucson, Arizona. Uh, hope you're staying out of the heat in Tucson. But thanks for joining us today. Hopefully, this will keep you out from going outside in the heat. And we have Trond from Norway. Great to see you back on. Thanks for joining us today. All right, always wonderful to see Dave Glick on. Glad you can make it. He lives not far from me in Northern Virginia. All right, and we have the Linsk saying hello to everyone from Perth. And we would see WA as Washington State in America, but I believe it's Western Australia. Thanks for joining us from the Australian continent. Okay, so we see um, Dallas LaRue asks, uh, how does snap to zero crossing work? Uh, when should it be used and should it be used in conjunction with crossfades? Okay, so what the snap to zero is, a lot of times people will have to do crossfades if you don't have snap to zero on. But what the, the intention of like the snap to zero crossing, so say if we're in and we could activate it just right here, on our toolbar icon so we're going to activate that and let's just zoom in and say okay on this sample um, we could see where we have the positive and negative you know waveform amplitude and what we want to do is when if I cut directly here so let's say at this point where it's going into a positive and I turn my snap off so if I make a cut here, and this could result in a click uh, occurring because we've kind of cut not at the zero amplitude point. So with with snap with the um, with this function enabled, the snap to zero crossing. When I go to cut, it's not going to allow me to cut right at the peak of the waveform. And I'll make this kind of really obnoxiously tall so I can't cut right here because that could result in a particular um, 
you know, that could result in a click, an audible click. So it's only going to allow me to cut right at the zero crossing point. And a lot of people will, if they didn't have this function turned on and they make a cut here, they would often have to do a crossfade between those two sections to make up for that. So if, you know, a lot of times just simply having the snap point set to, you know, the snap to zero crossing, that now as we make a cut, that it's not, you know, it's pretty much going to be safe of having a click because we're going to snap just at the optimum point of the waveform so that we won't have an audible click with that. All right, so we see Ness says, um, this question is, hi, Greg. Uh, when in an automation lane, I always see a line to balance the volume. Uh, can I turn that on and off? How do I do that? You know, so generally you're gonna, you know, have the value representative of where the fader position is. So I'm gonna activate this particular project and let's say my fader position is near the bottom. Okay, so I'm, so let's say I go to, this particular audio track here at the beginning and my my fader level is down here so we get an idea that we're at minus 28.1 db so when we go into our volume automation this is just indicating the particular value of where the fader currently is and as we adjust the fader we could see that that change automatically reflect in that particular line so that's just there because if you you know just automated that particular event so say if i come here that we would see where the where the existing you know as a frame of reference where that automation line is and where the value is so that's why it's shown so let me know if that makes sense because there you know and it, it's showing it because there is a pre-existing state of that particular parameter you know so other things you know if we go to like a plug-in parameter that hasn't been adjusted or automated may not have a particular state already so that's why the automation is shown all right always wonderful to see john costigan checking in from kenosha wisconsin we have spike williams always great to see you from rhonda wales all right and we have uh bart van mulebrock mulebrock uh checking in from belgium sending greets and beats from belgium thanks for joining us All right, so we see uh, Bren Hawkins just asking others. It says, uh, Cubase 12 recent update seems to crash DAW even after being saved. Has anyone experienced this issue? So I haven't come across that. Um, but one thing you could always try is starting up the program uh, and maybe try to delete the preferences or disable the preferences. So if you start the program holding uh, Alt, Control, Shift, or Command, Option, Shift, depending upon your operating system, at that point, you could uh, run the program with the existing with the existing preferences disabled, and see if that makes a difference for you. All right, so we have Ness sending greetings from Holland. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we have a question from Esteban Carlos Benson. Um, can anyone recommend a long video showing someone producing beats with audio warping? Uh, I come from Ableton. I want, to, uh, I want to see a producer in Cubase interested in workflow. So I don't know of a long video 
But if you're just kind of doing, you know, if you're doing audio warping, like warp editing, you know, what we could do is let's, I will come over. All right, so let's say I have this one event. So uh, first thing I'm gonna do is let's say if I just double click and we go into the sample editor. So, you know, one of the things you could do is just say, okay, I just want to let me just take this out of spectral layers real quick. All right, so we'll go to our hit points. All right, so if we kind of know what our hit points are, and we can find these kind of rhythmically, we could adjust the threshold. And at that point, we could convert those hit points. If you go to um, your audio menu, you'll see real-time processing. And you can say create warp mark, warp markers from hit points. Uh, and at this point, we're going to just say, let's go to free warp. And then let's say, you know, I'll just go ahead and play this particular... Right, so we'll just loop this and anytime that I want it to just you know reposition audio event we could just kind of come over here and so if this is the kind of warping that you're referring to you could just you know come right over kind of a terrible edits but you can freely move any part so let me know if that's kind of what you wanted to accomplish or if you just wanted the warping to uh, you know if you want to do more kind of real-time warping where at this point you could just say okay I want this to automatically follow once we have something set into musical mode we could say, okay, we're going to have our original tempo. Na, 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 na. And I'll just get to solo this track here. So if we want to listen to this in the original tempo, um, we could, or if we put it into musical mode, it's automatically going to follow kind of whatever tempo that we have laid out for us. So, you know, once it's in musical mode, you could, if it, if it has the particular tempo information, it could automatically play and stretch in real time. So, you know, audio warping could be kind of two different processes there. But let me know if that makes sense for you. Always wonderful to see uh, Razel from Denmark and also uh, Mr. Dolly67 checking in from Denmark. All right, so we see a um, question. Uh, is it possible to record the click track and get it into Groove Agent and the drum editor? So you, you could do it pretty easily. So let's just say, um, but a lot of times you may not need to with some new functionality, but if you want it in the drum editor, uh, we'll just come. Let's we'll do a new project just to show this. Or we'll just actually. Okay, so let's say I want to go to um, drum part here. All right, so we'll create one measure. And we just turn my snap on so we can make sure that we're snapped. Directly to the grid here. All right, so we have our one measure. So let's say I want to switch this to, um, let's do something like a. Let's do like a rim shot. All right, so now I could just come over here. I'm going to say, okay, let's just paint in quarter notes. All 
Okay, so let's say I have one measure of drums. Okay, I'm gonna open up an instance of, we could open up our instance of Groove Agent. I will just cut this particular pattern. So I'll cut that pad for now. And we could just drag And you could just have that pattern. So you can make a pattern and have it play back from Groove Agent. And you could now drag that back into the project. But a lot of times, you know, what a lot of people may not know is, let's say if we have our particular uh, click track already, let me just undo my pattern change. Let's say I have my left and right locator set that I could come right over here let's go to edit and we will go to signature track and project and we could just say uh, render audio click or render MIDI click between left and right locators so I could just render a quick audio click and if we just listen to this here we could just have this the click track playback as an audio file. So you could render the click track as MIDI, render it as audio, create a simple pattern and drag that to a Groove Agent pad to have access to the click track if you wanted to play back solely from the instrument. So let me know if that's helpful. All right, so we have uh, Arif B checking in from Holland. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we see just from Bart that he sent his question yesterday. So we usually get to the mailed in questions towards the end of the live stream, but we'll get to it. Thanks for sending it in advance to Club Cubase at Steinbert.de. Uh, All right, wonderful to see Peter checking in from Montreal. John Kosikin wants everyone to hit the like button so that we keep the live streams going. Um, so we see uh, from DJ Ride, uh, hi Greg, what sample packs do you recommend for Groove Agent for electronic music? So I think a lot of the ones that come with it already are are quite good. Let's see what which ones I have. I, I sometimes don't have all the third party ones installed. They, yeah, they don't send them to me. I think they would, but um, but let's go ahead and just take a quick look at some of the. So if you're looking for like particular groove agent, uh, you know, the ones that come like laser beams is, is quite good as well. So if you wanted to just, um, I think I have mostly kind of more of the acoustic sounds. Uh, let's check out like Neuro Mindset. <laughs> so I'll turn that down to kill, sorry. So I'm not sure if that one sold separately, but we'll just go through a couple of those. I'll just load kit with. And there's also, so let's just come over. Then you could also get into like one of the ones that does come with it is uh, I know this one comes with it is the laser beams. Like I have friends that just made a ton of money doing jingles, just you know. And if you get into some of the other. on a jingle recently. And this, you know, I think came in Cubase 10 or 10.5, maybe it'll... So if you haven't explored all of these, just a quick sample. 
point. So all sorts of great content that comes with it, but check out the Neuro Mindset. I'm not sure if that one comes. I can't remember if that comes standard, but there's lots of great options available. All right, so we see uh, from Ronin Sakao Music. Um, uh, hi Greg, uh, can I control more than 20 at Ranger events? Is there, or there's only 20 events in a generic remote for a Ranger? Can I add more? Okay, so when we have a Ranger events, let me just add a quick a Ranger track. So let's see if I have, I'll just add. All right, so let's say if we have multiple songs kind of all right so right now we have more than so we just did 26 So let's say we have roughly 36 arranger tracks. So, you know, what we what we can control 20. Um, so let's come over to like our MIDI remote, you know, so we can record. I'll just open this up and we go to the arranger track. So let's go to key commands to arranger. All right, so you could, you have 20 different unique arranger chains that could be triggered here but you also just have um you know next chain step so you could just you know come directly over here and go to particular chains so once you have uh, you know different things um you know you could just simply you know go to the next arranger chain and then have 20 more you know so this could all be laid out for so let's say okay i come here but yeah i think we've seen most of So let's say if we, um, I'll take this arranger chain and we'll rename it, we'll call it one, all right. And we'll call this one two. So I could come over here and let's, Go to my remote control. All right, so I'm gonna take this and we'll say next. Chain step. So if we just wanted to come over here and let's say So here you could just use the generic remote to navigate to all of your different arranger chains. So it doesn't necessarily go 
to a particular to a particular one, but you could have it go to the next or previous arranger step within the chain. So while you can recall 20 specifically, you could recall one and then go next step, go to a, you know a, a different arranger event, and you could go sequentially just using the next step. So again, just just a key command when you come over here to under arranger. So you can navigate to 20, then that's usually how kind of most sets will be, uh, you know, will contain 20 songs. Um, I remember working with this with Donny Osmond, he had a set of 19 songs, so we added another one for Donny for like a three hour Vegas show. Um, but you could just do next uh, chain step and previous chain step as well to access all the other ones. So let me know if that would work for you. All right, so we see a question. Uh, how do you tune vocals that are in a different key to your song automatically in Very Audio? So if we, let's say we have our chord track here and we're going to set up our chord and we'll say, okay, we'll be in D major. I go to my vocals. And if we're in Very Audio and this came in version 12, we'll go to Very Audio here, we'll edit, and we could do scale correction. So we could say, okay, I want to use the chord track. And at this point, we could quantize pitches to match the scale. So in version 12, once you're in Very Audio, you could use the editor scale, which you can um, enter in, or you could have it automatically utilize the chord track. So you could define a scale here, say, okay, we're in D major. Now I could just quantize pitches to fit into the appropriate key. Okay, um, all right, so we have Stefan checking in from Sweden. All right, so we see from um, RFB says, uh, question, is it possible to use logical preset in other plugins apart from Cubase plugins? So generally the logical, um, you know, the logical project logical editor. So like when we look at a project logical editor or a MIDI logical editor, it's generally not plugin specific. Um, so, you know, it's not changing parameters of a particular plugin. So, you know, we could do stuff like, um, so let's say, okay, I want to come here and we'll delete muted events. So, you know, while a lot of this, you know, can affect more of the data, you know, but it's not necessarily tied to a plugin you know, either Steinberg or third party, it's more kind of like, and if we have the MIDI logical editor, um, that's going to be more, again, tied directly to just to the actual notes. And it's not really changing particular uh, parameters, you know, so this is kind of manipulating MIDI data. The MIDI data is pointing back perhaps through Steinberg or third party plugins, but it's the MIDI data or like, you know, doing more of the project logical editor. Like, you know, we could turn off plugins, we could bypass plugins, you know, bypass inserts, etc., stuff like that. So, but it's not really um, limited it's not really designed specifically for plugins um so it's not doesn't preclude or doesn't exclude third party plugins in any way but if there's a particular function that you want to do maybe you could let me know um that that maybe you're not understanding i'd be happy to go through that all right my chat field just jumped let me just find my spot
Okay, so we have, um, I thought that was it. Okay, we have a question from D.L. White. Uh, hi, Greg, uh, Texas here. Can you explain copy and paste MIDI notes from one part uh, to another track preserving the relative positions uh, and combining kick and snare MIDI track notes into one groove agent track. Okay, so one of the tricks that you could do is if you wanted to preserve like the same exact timing when copying MIDI notes, all you need to do is like, let's say I move this event and I'll just, let me just take my snap off. So let's say I want to copy this data and this is the same principle for events or notes where if I copy this, unless I moved it accidentally. So I'm going to hold down my alter option key um, to, uh, to copy it. And then we could hold down control or command. And now if depending on the direction that you moved it, as soon as I just... So I'm going to copy and let's say I can freely move this position just All right, so I accidentally moved the position so I want to make a copy I hold down kind of my alt uh my alt key, alt or option key and I could move this and I could place it anywhere that I want. Now that I hold down control or command, if I moved it vertically first, and this is the key, if you move it vertically first, that direction that you move it in, so the alt key will make a copy. Now that I've moved it vertically, I hold down the control or command key. Um, and then, so again, I'm gonna move it here vertically, alt, copy, then hold down control. Now I can't move it in time. It's going to re kind of restrain the direction of that event. So now I can't move it left or right when the mouse is held down. So hold down the alt key if you want to preserve it or just the control or command key and that will restrain the, the edit. So let's say if I am here and I want to like double these notes up an octave. So I'm going to move it first. And let's say I, I accidentally moved it over. So let's say I copy and now I hold down the control or command key. Now I can't shift it in time. I can only move it vertically. And conversely, if I move it horizontally and I accidentally shifted pitch, I could now come over and now I can't adjust the pitch, the, kind of the vertical aspect. So hold down the Alt and then Control, but again, it's going to kind of restrict based on the direction that you first move the particular event. So, and that works on a project window or on within the editors themselves as well. All right, so we see from uh, D.L. White, um, it says, I had a corrupted project and successfully exported all tracks before abandoning it. Uh, however, I didn't know that MIDI doesn't export with OMF. Be careful. Is there another way to preserve a corrupt project? So, you know, once you have a project, if you have a corrupt project, and you know, OMF is not, or AAF isn't going to include MIDI data. So they're kind of MIDI unaware, if you will. But what I would do if you had a corrupt project is just go to import tracks from project select just select the particular project and then you could select all of the events and you could include automation and then at that point just say okay you could have it automatically go to new tracks and that would probably get all of your data in midi or instruments or you know whatever tracks are in your particular project so try to, you know, even if it's a corrupt project, you're not opening up the particular project, you're just opening up tracks from within that particular project. So come over here, select the project, and you know, if you think that it's maybe one plugin that's on a particular track, you could, you know, kind of just do a couple of tracks at a time. Okay, that imported, okay, good. Now let's try 
the next five tracks and you could just come over there and that's a good way to kind of get around if a plugin had corrupted your project all right always wonderful to see gerald ely from martinez california all right and we have filter freak on saying ho 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 we have braxel from texas and dl white is also saying hello All right, uh, so we see from Summit Musical Group. Uh, hi, sir, could you please explain the process of vocal mixing vocal mixing with heavy music tracks? Okay, so I may have something. Uh, let's see if it's in my recent projects. Doesn't look like it. Okay, so let me just open up particular project you know so generally with you know vocals a lot of it is going to be arranging stuff you know and you realize that you know mixes that often sound great um you know like a, a song with a great arrangement generally will always have a better mix because it's kind of almost mixing uh itself within the particular arrangement so let's say if I want to take this project, you know, there's a lot of stuff like, you know, distorted guitars can be in the same frequency range as vocals. So let's come over here and here we're going to have, it's not the heaviest song, but. So if the guitars were like I never promised you, super I over the top, but if you're missing me, let it be. Hit the road, gonna rock, gonna roll. So say we'll do something similar to this guitar. But, you know, a lot of times if the, you know, if you look at kind of the frequency response, so let's say if we come here and we'll just adjust. I'll just revert this project so we can get this back quickly. Bear with me just a moment. So let's say we make it all. And we'll put like maybe an EQ in here. So, you know, if this is kind of just carving away, you know, into where your vocals are. And we could take a look at this and I'll just remove just the automation on this. So let's say now we want to take our vocal here. So I'll just take this phrase here so we could just have the vocal but just between different me, tracks. So if we wanted to. Be, I know 
you're looking good I'm in the neighborhood I got some cheap wine Let's have a good time So I never promised you I'm gonna stick around So a lot of times, you know, making sure that you're not kind of conflicting But if you're missing me Let it be I know you're looking good I'm in the neighborhood I got some You know, so a lot of times, you know, guitars will be panned you know, like hard left and hard right. Let's have a good time. I never promised you. So we'll take these two guitars and let's say they're panned. And then the vocal could sit in the middle. But make sure, you know, like one that, you know, the musicians leave space for the vocal. You know, like I'm a bass player and, not, you know, people ask me what my role as a bass player is a lot. And I just say, you know, I'm my role is to make everyone else sound better so the vocalist is heard. You know, so as the guitar arrangements, you know, try to pan them and make sure that they're not trying to occupy the same frequency range. I always like to look at, you know, like if we go to like, you know, a keyboard of some kind, um, and I'll just show this visually here. You know, so if we want to look at it on, uh, we'll visualize a keyboard so i like to think of okay you know you have like you know if we think of drums we have like your kick your snare your hi-hat and your toms cymbals so you have lows mids highs and you want to have the lows mids highs of different instruments if your bass has all lows it's not going to cut through the mid range and be heard and it's not going to have definition if there's no high frequencies the guitars can't be sitting on top of the same exact notes as the vocal because they're just going to clash. So you could have things not clash uh, kind of harmonically, or you could choose to put them to mix them so that if this were the panning spectrum, that the vocals could be here and the guitars could be over here so that they have space. So there's a number of tricks like that, you know, but just try to make sure that. You know, I remember being in the studio at Bob Clear Mountain once, and, you know, and I've said this quote before, you know, that if the bass doesn't sound good, it's not the bass's fault. It's a keyboard, it's a guitar frequency, it's a kick drum. So, you know, so everything should kind of have its little place, you know, within the stereo panning spectrum and within the harmonic content so that you have a balance of different frequencies. All right, so we have a learn with Stephen ask, uh, this is Stephen from Sarasota here. How do I change instruments after I extract my hit points into a MIDI track? I have the track but can't seem to, uh, uh, F, I can't seem to how to make it a snare, for example. Thanks. Okay, so let's say I want to take my um, snare drum here. Okay, so one of the things you could do is just load up a particular instrument already so i'm going to load up let's say an instrument that i want let's say groove agent and i want the snare i want to use the snare so we'll just open it up in this project i'm going to All right, so let's say we just have this uh, kit loaded up here. Okay, so my snare is on D1, and I'm going to select and select this particular channel. Okay, now I could tell my snare to go to that particular channel. So I'm going to take this information here. Let's go to our hit points. All right, so I want to look at the particular hit points here. So we'll take a look in our zone. So I'm going to adjust my threshold so that we're not including stuff that's probably bleeding through. Then I'm going to say under the create tab, we're going to open this up and we'll say create MIDI notes. All right, so I'm going to choose, we're going to choose our velocity to be the dynamics. and. In my destination, I'm going to choose sel first selected track. So when I do this, I'm going to go ahead and select 
that particular groove agent track. Okay, so now we'll come over and we'll get to our export MIDI notes. And I'm going to put it on to D1 because that was the note that was the snare drum in the instrument. So now when I come back, it will now be just mapped out to include D1. So as we play back. I know you're looking good. So I'm going to open this up, make the snare louder. Now I'll take that and I'll just make this snare really loud. And I can mute the original. So now you muted the snares. So, you know, choose the destination, but, you know, if once you do this and you do the hit points, uh, so, you know, it, from within the sample editor, uh, you, know, you have the choice of you want to put it on a new MIDI track, Project Clipboard. So with the Project Clipboard, that would allow you to, basically, that's copying it, and then you could paste it into a particular track as well but the easiest way I found is you know have your destination already set and then just have Cubase automatically send it to that selected track so let me know if that makes sense and thanks for joining us from Sarasota been there many times a good friend of mine for college plays in the symphony there as principal bassist all right and we have Rich checking in from a hot 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 West Palm All right, so we just see from La Tropic, uh, teach me how to mix vocals. Um, you know, so it's, it's sometimes it's hard with questions like that because every song could require and every vocalist could require different things. You know, um, I think if you always do the same thing on every project that it gets, you know, it starts to sound very formulaic and it may not be what the project was, you know, what the song actually needs. Um, but a couple tips that I will share is like what I would generally do. Let's say we'll take this vocal here. What did you say? You know, a common thing is okay. We may go to the channel strip. I have just a little bit of compression, noise gate. I will. So let's say like I like the vocal, but maybe I want a little more intelligibility. If I to bypass the EQ, if needed, I will often put just a little bit of reverb on. Not too much where it's swimming, unless it's a very special effect. And if I wanted to add an effect, um, another effect that I would often kind of work with is just a, a simple delay. And one of the tricks to getting delays to work um, is just to have those synchronized to the tempo. Um, and sometimes I just, I really like just using a mono delay. Uh, and as soon as we add this, I'm gonna say, okay, let's make it, and a lot of people just do like quarter note delays and you could have this automatically sync to the project. So if we say, okay, I want a quarter note delay. And that's probably heavy on delay. But also try, instead of just like quarter or eighth notes, you always get really interesting results just doing maybe like a dotted quarter note delay. I'm We'll listen to that in context. Hey. 
so we were kind of just start from the beginning here. Let's say if I take off my channel strip. So let's say we have noise gate, maybe to cut out like any headphone bleed. A little compression, a little bit of EQ. Bit of delay again, it's kind of synchronized to the tempo. I'm on the outside looking in. You put the close side up on your heart, and you don't have to go, you know, too much with any effect. You know, like if you turn it on, you know, I was at a performance and. You know, someone just went crazy with their vocal and they added delay to their vocal and reverb and then he flanged the delays and, you know, it was just kind of almost irritating to listen to the vocal. Um, but, you know, always just kind of a little less is more, but, you know, simple dynamics processing to make sure everything is even. Uh, EQ, if necessary, you know, some people will automatically cut the low end. So if we'll come over here and you'll have kind of a, you know, a low cut just to get any rumble out. If there's rumble, sometimes people just do that. If there's no frequencies there, it's not really needed a lot of times. Uh, but, you know, just very simple, just a little bit of reverb, a little bit of delay. You can make your vocals sit great in the mix. So there's a couple of tips, but again, every single song, you know, will be a little different in what flavors you would use. Reading through comments. Always great to see Captain Energy music from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Not too far from me. Not too far from Taylor as well. All right. See Captain Energy music. Is very excited to see what Yamaha is doing with the new or updated montage or whatever they're releasing in October. So. All right, so we see Braxel asks, uh, does the new solid state UF1 work well with Cubase 12 Pro? So I think it works pretty well. One thing, someone had a question on it. Um, I think that it doesn't follow the selection. So if you select a track here, most single fader units, <clears throat> I <clears throat> don't have any personal experience with it. Um, that if you select a channel, that, that is the active channel. Uh, and they indicated that that wasn't working. Um, and it could be just that it's a design characteristic where you need to select the channels from the controller. But like on you know most single fader controllers, if you select um, the particular channel, that it would automatically, you know, just go directly. The controller would be controlling that channel, so you may have to initiate the uh, channel selection from the controller as opposed to having it followed. But that's something you could confirm with with SSL. But someone here was a little upset that that didn't work well. But it's not a design limitation in Cubase because even my uh, Korg Nano control can do it for a whopping seventy nine bucks. Okay, um, so we have a question. Um, is there a way to make record and able locked? Um, all right, so let's just try a new project. This might be, I remember something, it might be a Nuendo feature. Let me see if it's in. see if there's I know like Nuendo Live kind of has that um, let's see if we do the lock function here if that will lock record enable 
No, it doesn't seem to. All right, let me just make sure I have inputs defined. I mean, need dot. Yeah, so I think in Nuendo Live, there's a way of locking it. Um, but if we, depending on maybe the VST preference, um, if you have it set, it's the monitoring. Um, if you go to editing, and let's get a project and mix console so we'll say enable record on selected tracks if that preference again editing uh, project and mix console enable record on selected track that if we select another track that that won't affect the status that that will stay locked until you manually turn it off or disable that All right, so we have a question. Um, hi, Greg. Uh, how do you fix latency when pressing MIDI keyboard to trigger instruments? I lowered the buffer size, but it didn't help that much. All right, so realize that latency can be uh, can come from two different areas. It can come from your audio buffer size, which sounds like you already addressed by going into the control panel and lowering the buffer size and the latency can also be added by plugins so let's say if i want to go to this particular track and i have on on this track a lot of people uh, will kind of mix into plugins so let's say if i go to this track and i have inserts going on just not go to the routing and let's say I have a multi-band compressor this is always a good one uh, under dynamics so let's say so when you have kind of you know plugins you realize that you know for running more sophisticated uh, processing that you know the tax that you'll often pay is going to be latency so if you have a lot of plugins on your particular system, uh, and we could see this in our full channel view, we could enable our channel latency view. So we could see it right here. So I could see that on this particular track, just having those two insert plugins is generating, you know, we have two milliseconds of latency with the multiband envelope shaper, and then we have 113.4 from the multiband compressor. So this latency, when you go to play in a particular keyboard, is that latency from the plugins is added. Now, if you wanted to bypass that, we could turn on what's called the delay constrained delay compensation so if you have plugins that are causing latency and you wanted to bypass those particular plugins you could just click right here and turn on uh, the constrained delay compensation and that could bypass the plugins and so we could set kind of the threshold for that by going into your preferences and you could set the threshold here under I think it's under VST, so you can say, you know, if a plugin has more than 20 milliseconds uh, delay compensation, this is a threshold for recording, that we could just simply turn this off and that will bypass the plugins. So, um, so that's, it's probably going to be caused by your particular plugins that are in a session. So instead of going through and finding out which plugins are causing it, you could just click here on the left hand side, the bottom left, and activate the constrained delay compensation. And that will bypass the plugin so that you could play MIDI in with the latency not imposed by high latency plugins, but just by using 
uh, primarily using the buffer latency. So try activating the constrained delay compensation. Always wonderful seeing Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. Hope you're doing well in the heat. All right, and we see Daniela and Wilfried, uh, her husband, on. So thanks for joining us. All right, we see Michael Teams is relieving everyone's summer and heat anxiety by passing out ice cream generously as always. All right, so we have Uno Memento appears to be on vacation or on a holiday or away from his native Finland, and he's in Tallinn, Estonia. So thanks for joining us while you're away. Always wonderful to see Nick from Essex in the UK. And we have VTS 404. Uh, so we see from Daniela Tokan or Wilfried uh, is today the Zoom live stream. So it's going to be on Friday, the 28th. So we have one more live stream in, in July. So we'll be doing it on the 28th. See, you know, mementos on holidays and work at the same time. So. All right, so we have uh, Vishnu from India who asks, uh, Cubase 12 Pro, can we assign multiple samples in the sampler track and save that as an instrument? So the sampler track is designed to be a single instrument at once. So if we wanted to um, come over and we'll just say, okay, we'll just select. So we'll create a sampler track based on this. All right. Now, if we wanted to do multiple samples, uh, what we, you know, what we could do is just simply use Groove Agent SE, which comes with Cubase. So, if you wanted to now come over, and we'll activate, let's say, Groove Agent SE. I can now take any sample that I want. So, let's say, okay, I want to go to my EDM toolbox. Let's see, if there's samples in here. It's just MIDI. All right, so let's say, okay, I want to find like, so I could drag that. All right, and let's find a different sample. So let's say, okay, now I want to find maybe a drum. Let's find a beat. Right, and then we could find maybe like a synth. All right, so now I could just kind of come over here. And then all I have to do if I want to save this is we could just right click and we could say you know save uh, we could save export the kit and samples or just save it as a preset and it will call up the locations of all if you don't move the original samples you could just uh, save it like within a project so if you drag it into the project folder and then uh, tr you know, drag it to the samples, or you could just simply, at this point, if it's coming from different parts, just say export kit with samples. So if you want to use kind of multiple, uh, you know, multiple samples, you know, sampler track is designed for one single sample, multiple samples, you could just use Groove Agent SE. Right, so we see Orhan Aaron's wearing something, maybe possibly probably in a different language. So if it's a question, if there's anyone that could translate, that'd be appreciated. Let's 
Let's see. Uh, Best Green Jesus just says, uh, I guess with the neuro mindset, that it is sold separately, and he enjoys that sound pack. Jazz Dude has a link to templates to listen to all the 100 different Groove Agent SE kits available on the Cubase Nation Discord. So it's a great way to audition and discover sounds that you may not have experienced before. And we see from uh, Vishnu says, I think how you can do that with some extra clicks, but I just thought of checking about the sampler track. So yeah, it's going to be basically, um, yeah, Groove Agent SE would probably be, you know, you have 128 pads and you have 32 velocity layers, so. Okay, so a question from uh, Patrick Emanuel A, also from India. Thanks for joining us for the live stream today. Um, this question is, how to easily apply presets, macros by click, because there's no way I can remember everything on key commands, apply macro by clicking. Uh, is it possible? Are there any options? Um, so, you know, if you, you know, once you have something selected, all your macros would just show up directly here. Um, and if you can't remember the keyboard shortcuts, you know, like the little stream deck options, you know, I know many people that have set up touch screens where they could label each of the macros for a particular, you know, on the screen. So you don't have to remember the keyboard shortcut and they could just, you know, have that, you know, fire off either a MIDI note in generic remote, or you could you know, fire off the key commands that you've designed. So if you have like hundreds of macros, you know, maybe consider getting like an Elgato stream deck because uh, you could label each button what the function of the macro is. And there's, you know, you could have one page that's kind of a nested folder of another page of a nested folder, etc. So. So check that out, Patrick. All right, so we see from Ace Amadeus. Uh, Hi, Greg, hope you're doing well. Been working with uh, PC desktop, uh, Windows 8, and some Cubase 8.5 projects. Will Cubase 12, new Steinberg licensor, erase my USB e-licensor data? Or can I still work on other machines? So your e-licensor data is totally separate and is not going to be affected by the new Steinberg licensing. So, um, so we're not going to erase your license that you already have. So you could just simply utilize your e-licensor in your old machine and use the Steinberg licensing on your new machine. All right, so we see um, Zephaniah uh, asks, uh, is there a way to stack instruments in Pad Shop without having to use another track um, using Artist on 10 PC? So, you know, generally, you know, I think the best method would be to, you know, use, uh, you know, to use a different track, uh, especially like when you get into rendering your files, it could be much cleaner. So let's say I have a pad shop sound. I want to stack two or three pad shops together. So come over here. Okay, so. Okay, so I have that. Let me go to another pad shop instrument. We'll see. All right, so if I wanted to stack these two together, um, you know, is, uh, you know, so this kind of makes it very clean so you could render them independently. Um, but so let's say we have our two pad shops. Um, I could create a folder for these. So if we wanted to just right click and say, um, move selected tracks to new folder, then I could just select I could close the folder and say pad shop layer 
and now I could just arm this folder and both tracks will play and respond. And then when I, if I needed to render them separately, you know, they're just going to be together there. They would have all their own routing, their own effects. So maybe consider just putting them into a folder and then you just record enable the folder and then you could have whatever instruments there. So. Okay, so we have a question um, from Abdurov uh, who asks, Greg, is there a way to export multiple audio clips with each their duration within one audio track instead of having hundreds of audio clips and go through them all? So you can still do that if you want, but I'll show you a trick. So let's come over here to audio and I just want to take a number. Of, let's say I'll take these files here and we're going to line them all into one track. Okay, just try that again. I thought I had them in. Here, I'll just drag several in here. All right, so let me just I'll just show you an example of this in my jump off project here. Okay, so let's say I have all of these particular vocal files here and these are all different lengths as we can see um, all right um, so you want to export multiple clips each with their own duration within one audio track instead of having hundreds of audio clips to go through them all so if you wanted to export all of these um, all you have to do is and we could put this into we'll say let's go to export and then we want to choose selected events. So I'm going to select all of the particular events and we can say, okay, I want to export these um, as separate events. We could have them dry or the complete signal path. We could add tail, we could give it a name. So we'll say let's export and I want to give it a particular path. So we'll come over here. Um, I'll just put this on to desktop. I think I may have a delete me folder already. All right. And I'll choose a new folder here. So let's just call this July 25th. All right. In the, all right. So now I'm going to just come over here. We'll say, okay, we're going to select that particular folder and hit export and Done it. So I'll just uh, create unique names, and now it's just basically exporting each of the files. When we go to our desktop now, all of the files, regardless of different lengths, it's a good desktop. To delete me. To July 25th and there's all the files that we just exported so again just come over to file and export and if you have the if you could just hold down if you want to, if you have like a file here you could just hold down the shift key and double click and that will select all the events on a particular track and export selected events so let me know if that would do the trick for you
All right, so we see um, major feature quest. Uh, multiple Cubase aspects operated by multiple people simultaneously for one project, like in a traditional studio, one setting effects, one mixing, one MIDI, etc. That would be awesome. So, you know, we've had that functionality. It's actually going to be going away. It's being discontinued because no one uh, used it. But we had VST Transit, and that way you could you could collaborate on different uh, projects with different people. So it wasn't like a real-time thing. But Nuendo does have kind of some of the functionality where you could make edits and upload and do changes. So one person could be doing MIDI. Another person could be working on vocal editing and upload changes dynamically in real time. So it's a function of Nuendo that's been there since version 3.2. So over 20 years. So it is kind of more of a Nuendo feature. So if you want that, you could upgrade to Nuendo. So we see from uh, Vishnu says he needs to explore more. He's working with lo-fi hip-hop track this week and is really surprised by the quality of included samples with Cubase 12 Pro. All right, so we see... Um, Uh, Patrick Emanuel A just ask uh, how to change the notes automatically inside the key editor by just changing on chord pad the notes automatically change if I played only three notes uh, three note chords and apply seventh on chord track with seventh appears okay so I'm not sure if you need the chord pads for that let's go ahead and take a quick look so let's say we have Right, so I'm going to come over here. I think we have some, let's say, quick chord progression. I'm going to drag these chords to the roads. Okay, I'm just going to glue these together. Okay. All right, so we have this. Okay, so, you know, I think that you could just come to the logical editor, and there may even be a preset for this. Let's see if there is one. Let's see if it's going to be... So we see that we're going to have some uh, like switching major to minor so we could maybe all right so we'll say um, so let's say I have a chord here so let's say okay I have a Looks like we're in a typical G chord here. So I want to add maybe a seventh to the chord. Um, so let's, we'll just start from scratch and see if we can do it. All right, so we want to, um, let's see if we do an insert. Type is equal to note. Um, Say value one. And let's
let's see if I have my chord track. I'm just gonna drag these over so that they're in time this time. Grab this and all right. I'm just going to just take one of the chords and we'll take this as a preset. See if we can insert to seventh. All right, so we could delete, let's say, the do, let's say, we want to delete the major third. Okay, so we could delete the particular note. Um, and let's see if we could do insert exclusive. So I'll, I'll see if there's a way I'll, I could play around with that some more, but you could also maybe use um, maybe the quarter MIDI plugin as well. So if we play, you know, here you could just kind of take one particular note as you play and let's say we want to do um, you know single chords you want to be minor seventh and this way you could just use the quarter plugin for that and there's probably a way of doing it with logical editor and I can see if I can get it sorted out for Friday's live stream Patrick but give that a shot And I'll try one other quick thing, just out of curiosity. If we're in, let's say, the global. So let's say if I add a G7 chord here, and we go to You know, let's say if we have a G7 here, I could take this particular event, here's another approach to it, and we could choose to have it automatically um, follow from the chord track. So now we could, when we look at that chord, we could automatically have, You know, so you could just change the chord here, and if the event is set to follow the chord track, then it could follow as well. So it's a different approach you could take, Patrick.
All right, so we see from uh, Pat Matt. Um, Hi, Greg, is there a way to save current settings of VST inserts uh, in project to its A if B is active and vice versa in toggle to A if B is selected so I can track changes from that point? Okay, so let's say I'll take... this particular track let's give it a shot so I know we could do like one plug in at a time if you don't have automation so let's say I wanted to come here and I want to put filter on so I'll just solo this Alright, so say I want to put um Okay, so I think what we could do is in the mixer, and this could, you know, this could, if you have automation, this may affect um, particular aspects. So let's say we have, okay, so I could take a particular snapshot. All right, so I'm going to take a picture and then I want to go to a completely different vocal chain. So let's say, okay, now I want to have a delay. Uh, I want it to have a ring modulator. And let's do uh, an EQ, like a graphic EQ. Okay, so now we listen to it. All right, so I could take a so uh, that kind of delay so we could take a snapshot of this and then if you wanted to recall snapshot one and we could go to your mix console snapshot recall settings so i just want to recall only the inserts of this and we could do this for um so again if you're you know this, you could do this kind of pre-automation so let's say i wanted to go to this snapshot, I could just come right over here. And we can now see all those particular plugins. And if I go to snapshot two, all of the plugins will be. And let's, let's go to snapshot one. And now you could. And say, okay, I liked this one better so you know maybe employing mixed console snapshots but if you have automation the snapshots really don't take into account automation so maybe experiment before you get into automation but that way you could take and you could choose to recall different components so you could say okay i want the inserts in eq but not the channel strip or the send or the pan or volume so you could work with the mixed console snapshots for that Okay, so we see um, from Ace Amadeus, um, could you please show how to use a sampler, how to import a Moog sample wave and spread it across the keyboard? Okay, so let's say I was just looking for quick, uh, spread it across the keyboard, 
we just read the whole thing. Uh, in different ranges and how and where do I save the new sampler patch? Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to, let's just take a quick, uh, I want to find maybe a bass. Alright, so say I wanted to just drag, uh, take that, and I'm going to, so we now have right clicked that. So once we take a sample in, so let's say I just want like maybe we'll truncate it to just like maybe one note. So, or, you know, whatever we want. So it's a... So we'll pick just like maybe our start. And then if we wanted to have that loop, we could just come over and just say, okay. And we could say at this point, I wanted this to audio warp so that when I play, So we could just, as soon as it's in the sampler track, all you have to do then is play it. If you wanted to maintain the same speed, you know, just like a traditional sampler, if you play it higher, it's gonna play back faster. But if you wanted to maintain a constant speed, enable audio warp. Now that we've done this, we could see that in our project that we will go to our pool window under media and then we will see a sampler track. So we can see our particular samplers there. So these are our files that are in the sampler track. Um, and then all I would have to do is we see the preset name, just come over here. Let's say save track preset. We'll call it Ace Amadeus. And then you could just, you know, go directly to your particular media bay. And when you need to access it again, just go to your user presets, track presets, sampler, and then any other project, you could just have your Ace Amadeus preset. So if we drag, double click to add that, we can now just come right over and that's all you have to do. Okay. So we see uh, Pat Matt just says, uh, and this might be going back to the question of the AB, says I would have old settings in A and modified in B so I can see what changed from that point. So yeah, I think the track presets could work for that or the mixed console snapshots. Sorry, my chat field just jumped on me. Okay. Okay, so we have from uh, Patrick Emanuel A asks, uh, I have a chord track, how to transpose entire section of upcoming chords to follow the trans, I guess transposition, like if I want to change a root note, C major to F major, all other chords should follow the root to its, t okay, so let's say I have, and I'll just, uh, we'll get our roads patch here. Let's go to our chord pads. All right, so let's say if we're uh, directly here, so I think all you have to do is you could actually just transpose. 
using the pitch bend wheel. But if they're all kind of set to follow, um, so we could just say the chord editor here. So let's see if we. Um, but I think they're, you know, so you can transpose in real time using the pitch bend wheel. Um, but there is kind of like a root key setting. Um, I think that we could set. Just all right, so if you hit uh, F2 and E2, so you could, so once you go to the settings here, we could transpose all up by hitting F2 and E2. So let me see. If I come over, let me just check where my controller is set to. Okay. And we're going to take off the play remote. Just transpose these up. All right, so we'll just, um, one setting is here sorry just find one setting Just the little latch keys, but um, all right, let me see if I can just assign one tier two. So if you want to just come over to and we'll look at the chord pads. So you can see that we could just transpose the different chord pads. So let's see if we but you know you could just use the particular uh, pitch bend wheel and there's the key commands for transposing so and you could transpose the different pads that way Alright, we 
reading through comments. All right, so we just see uh, from Patrick says uh, Greg on chord pad selection. I dragged, uh, drag drop to pattern. Uh, but if I need to change the inversion of the chord, how can I do that? Like an easy way, just to select what sounds better. So if you just come right over here, um, and let me just turn this on. So, so you could just select a chord, and, and if you wanted to do kind of different voicings, or if you wanted to add tensions. But as you just click right over here, just go to your voicing. And then you could choose. And you can see it just kind of go through different voicings for your particular chord. Okay, Michael Teams wants people to smash the like button. And you see he's diligently distributing ice cream. Okay, Riverside, uh, Riverside Art 88 is asking if people have used uh, Android with a UR interface. The Steinberg UR interface, so maybe if someone has. Okay, so we see from uh, DL White says, uh, thanks for your answer. However, my copy paste MIDI problem is selecting the notes from one part and adding them to another part. Uh, example, snare kick notes onto the same part when creating or adding to an existing part. Okay, sorry for misunderstanding. All right, so let's say if I have uh, multiple MIDI events here, so let's say I Let's say I have one note here and I have, let's say, all kicks and snares. All right, and I come to this particular event and we'll go higher. Okay, so right now when we copy events on top of each other, it'll often kind of look like this. So if we wanted to merge all those together, grab the glue gun and hold down, I think it's the Alt key. And now all events will be within one particular editor. So, so if the events are kind of stacked on top of each other like so, but there are separate parts and you double click on one. Just where you see kind of the diagonal lines indicate that the events are stacked. Grab the glue tool, the glue tool, and hold down Alt or Option and click and now that will merge all of the events into one single, one single part, one single event. So again, just Alt, and glue and now you have one nice happy event so let me know if that is what you wanted to do DL White All right, so we see from uh, Patrick Manuel A says, uh, Greg, on, uh, on the MIDI logical editor position in chords, we have options like number of note uh, note part, position in chord part, position in chord track. Uh, how to use them if I try to get different results? Can you explain how they work? Okay, so let's come up to... All right, so I'm going to take this... Roads part here, and we'll let me just all 
All right, so let's say I wanted to delete, you know, thirds of the chords based on chord track. So we could go to like the MIDI logical editor, all right, and we can say, I want to erase, or we'll choose to delete notes that are equal to uh, major third, minor thirds, and we'll say, or major thirds. So I'll add, or context variable. So we'll say equal to, and we'll say position in chord. Now we could also do this using the chord track. So let's say I just now want to get rid of all of the, th you know, major or minor thirds. So I'll come over here and now all the thirds, because, you know, it may not know exactly what chords are intended, uh, but if you choose the chord definition directly from here, at that point, you could choose to delete. Now, if we also wanted to choose to transform, let's say I want to take all the notes that are major or minor thirds, and I wanted to adjust their position, and we will subtract by, um, or we'll add, you know, one beat. So I can come over here. Now every note that's a major or minor third can just be shifted over. So we could do different stuff like that. Um, but, you know, we could choose within the chord track, you know, and then we could choose again, you know, its interval. And then you could also choose note number within a chord. So if it sees chords, you can say, okay, I want the lowest note in a chord to be deleted. So maybe I wanted these subs. Um, so we'll just say, uh, we'll erase this. And let's say I want to get rid of the lowest notes within the chord. We could, um, so we'll just say uh, note number in chord, lowest is zero. Let's go ahead and delete. Then you could get rid of the lowest note positions within chords as well. So it's a couple things you could do with the MIDI logical editor. All right, so a question from Gerald Ely uh, says, hey Greg, is there a key command to toggle the monitor button? I mapped it to my remote, uh, but I prefer a key command. All right, so I thought it was maybe, is it? I'll just try a couple real quick. It's markers. All right, so let me, select an actual one. All right, so let's come over to our key commands real quick and see if there's one set up. Okay, so uh, I think if we just choose monitor here, so let me just set a key command, and this would be under edit. So I'm gonna choose find a key command that's not assigned. Okay, so I'll assign that particular key command. So yeah, you can just set up a key command. So we'll come over to uh, export to again, your key commands under edit. And at this point we will just under edit monitor and you could assign a particular key command right there. So let me know if that's what you want to do, Gerald.
All right, so you see rude screen just says hi Greg great tutorials all as always many thanks from South UK thanks not sure which one it was but yeah we'll have some more coming all right so we see from uh, summit musical group says uh, thanks a lot sir you teach very widely love from India so we seem to have a lot of people from India on that's great thank you for the kind words Um, so we see uh, today I've been sitting and experimenting with all stock plugins in Cubase. Um, I think we don't need any third-party plugins. What's your thoughts? Uh, I think Cubase did this intentionally. You know, we want to offer great solutions because there's nothing worse. And, you know, we've seen over years, we've been doing VST since, you know, 1996. So it's been a long time. Um, and realize that, you know, We've seen so many companies that are like have a great plug in and you know all of a sudden that company no longer exists and the plug in is never going to get updated from 32 bit to 64 bit and we want to have to offer a lot of functionality to our users uh, and know that you know it's going to be compatible with every other Cubase user regardless of you know what plugins that they third party plugins that they have any or they don't have any. But we want to, you know, you to be able to do kind of a full production without having to have any third-party solutions. You know, we love our third-party partners, and we think it's wonderful that they do offer so many great functions for Cubase. Um, and the user has a choice, but I think, you know, if you don't experiment with, you know, the internal plugins that you're, you know, one, you could save a lot of money. Um, and, you know, I don't really find myself using a lot of third-party plugins for my work, so. But we just want to offer great stuff for our users. All right, so we have a question uh, from Plastic People Records. Um, and the question is, hi, Greg. Uh, question, mix inside a box. After audio for vocal... Uh, in through say input one and audio one should I use mono or mono config or mono in stereo out or stereo is Cubase handling this internally different so generally I would have the a mono track for a vocal and then have that going directly to a stereo output and that way you could pan the vocal um, you know or pan any mono source within the stereo field it's going to be going out of probably a stereo output, a stereo mix down into a stereo monitoring device by the end user. So, you know, Cubase can handle that. So if you wanted to do it to a mono out, you can, but you know, most people would just choose a mono audio track that's going to be routed to a stereo output. So when you go to add an audio, say, okay, I'm recording, you know, a my vocal I'm using I'm not using a stereo microphone and I want to be able to at this point just add the track and be able to pan it and that's the most typical configuration all right uh, always wonderful to see Sable Winters uh, number 68 on the thumbs up button so thank you for that Sable that was it was an hour ago so thank you for that we'll try my best to catch up um and we're hoping to see you uh on friday's live or uh, zoom meetup and we're all looking forward to your new gadgets she always has the best gadgets i'm envious but i have a kid and i buy gadgets for my son so i had to get gadget get my gadget fix vicariously through other people and sable's great for that all right, uh, so we have a question from Plastic People Records. Uh, please, can we update to a few more words to ask questions? Uh, is it possible? Hard to ask specific questions with so little characters would be really helpful. Thanks, Greg. Um, so it's a limitation. There's a 200 character limit in the YouTube Live. If I could, you know, expand it, I would. Uh, but, you know, and, I, and you can split across your question to multiple posts. A lot of people do that, or that's why we also have the email address. 
So you could send longer questions to clubcubase at steinberg.de. So that's you know one of the specific reasons that we do that as well. If it's a little more involved or longer question, um, so you know send send it as an email to clubcubase at uh, steinberg.de, and you could handle that. And we'll get it onto the next live stream. All right, so Rowan Carter, my child in my son's class name, Rowan Carter, uh, says, hello from the UK. I joined halfway through the previous explanation. We were talking about going from audio to MIDI trigger groove agent or groove agent to trigger another MIDI. Sorry, I joined a little late. So no problem on joining late. Uh, you know, there's no tardy slip. The only caveat is if you join late, you have to hit the like button immediately, but we'll show you again so let's say i have a particular project here and i have a groove agent track loaded so i'll go ahead and open this up and all right so kind of generic acoustic drum sound so what i want to do is to take um maybe the kick drum of this particular track let's see if my mouse scroll wheel is going to Operate here. Oh, I have the folder closed. All right. So, um, so I want to take, you know, let's say I want to do drum triggers. So I have this track selected. So I want to take my kick drum here. And I'm just going to double click to go into the sample editor. And we'll go to hit points. And I'll say, let's edit the hit points. And we could kind of zoom in our sample editor, make sure that this is all, like our thresholds are, are appropriate. All right, and then, so I have my Groove Agent track selected. I'm gonna say, we want to create, <clears throat> you'll see this little create tab. If you don't see all the options, just reveal it. And then we'll choose MIDI notes. And I'm gonna put this on to C1 because that's where kicks are. I want to retain the dynamic velocities and we're gonna put it onto the first selected track. I hit okay. And let me just, maybe I unselected the track accidentally. Sorry, so we go MIDI notes. Hit OK. And now we're just layering into Groove Agent. <clears throat> now I'll mute my kick tracks here. And now it's just playing the sample. So we turn off Groove Agent, not going to hear any kick. And I could pan it. I just select the particular sample here. If I wanted to tune. So just kind of that fast and easy to do drum replacement. Let me just clear my throat real quick. Sorry. All right. So let me know if that's helpful for you, Rowan. All right, <clears throat> so I see from uh, Clutterman says you have 12.8 milliseconds of latency that works for you. Um, if I was tracking, <clears throat> you know, I would, you know, I have built in DSP in my audio interfaces, so it doesn't really bother me, um, but I could always lower the latency, but for doing a presentation like this, 12.8 milliseconds is fine. And as Jazz Dude said, it's about 12 feet <clears throat> difference. Hmm. Sorry about that. All right, uh, so we see from Jeffrey Menken, um, is there a way to control 
<clears throat> select voices uh, on my Yamaha Mo XF8. So you may have, let me see if there's a, uh, a there might be a script that's built in. Let's come over here and just see if there's a lot of Yamaha devices. Yeah, so if you wanted to, you could just say, okay, I have a Yamaha Mo XF and hit OK. And then what you want to do is assign it to a particular output port. So let's say, okay, I am I want it to go out of my, you know, USB port or I want it to come directly in and out of my UR24C. So if you want to select your particular patches, we can just say, okay, I want to add a MIDI track. We'll add that and we're going to say, okay, the output is going to go to my Yamaha Mo XF. Um, let's see if it's, now that we've added it. Yeah, so there's our motif. Okay, so we see our, Yamaha Mo XF, and then we can say, okay, I want to use, I'll just, <clears throat> we'll define, let's say that as our device, and now we could, should be able to see just the output. And then once you have that connected, <clears throat> you could um, yeah, because I don't have it connected, you could just see if I could trick it into something else. Let me do it in the setup. So again, go to Studio to studio setup to your MIDI device manager. I'll just delete some of these. Okay, so now I have that assigned to a particular port. Um, okay, let me just. All right, let me just do it one more time here because. Since I don't have the hardware, I'll just. then you could see kind of all of your patch banks. So that's, so once you kind of come over here, you can say you want to open the device and then you could see your device and then see your patch banks and then all of your different patches will be accessible right there. So, but yeah, you could do it just kind of like that and then 
or you could just see your different <clears throat> bank and program change messages right there. <clears throat> okay, so we see from uh, Plastic uh, People Records, uh, can you explain when to use mono and mono configuration versus mono in, stereo out, versus stereo in and out? Um, example right now on electric guitar, I use direct routing for mono track, two effects track, and insert amp effects there, right? So if you want, you know, a mono track, if you put an insert effect on it, would the effect would be mono. So if you have guitar effects like a stereo delay, a stereo reverb, stereo chorusing, you'd probably want to have the effects on an effect send. So, you know, because you're going to have one source for the guitar, you know, sometimes people can record, you know, a stereo guitar track, um, like, like, you know, uh, I've been in Peter Frampton's studio and what he does is he has three cabinets uh, and the outer two cabinets are for effects and the middle cabinet is dry. So he'll record the outer cabinets as a stereo track and the, and the middle cabinet as a mono track. So you know, depending on the setup, but if you want it, your effects to be in stereo, then use an, 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 an effects track to get the effects in stereo. Otherwise, they would be mono. <clears throat> you see plastic people records yeah you know, just commenting on the lack of characters so yeah it's a limitation of youtube so okay Okay, so we see, um, hello from France. I would like to know if there's an option to grant a title of 440 hertz to 432. Uh, before it was there, I can no longer find. Thank you for all the work you do and the help you bring. Um, so I'm not sure what you want to grant a title of. You know, Cubase will record the audio of whatever um whatever frequency it is so if you tune your guitar at a at 432 or 442 or 440 cubase will just capture that audio now sometimes what you want to do is your different instrument tracks you may want to um you know to deal with your instrument tracks at different you know if you tune your guitar to 432 and for a and that's your tuning scale you may have to adjust like you know the tuning uh, internally so you could like within retrolog for instance i could just come here and say we're going to have an a as 432 so and that's up to the instrument because midi itself doesn't really have a specification for a is 432 but a lot of instruments you could just simply detune or you know set the tuning scale so let me know if it's for an instrument or for audio tracks that would be helpful for my understanding all right okay so we see uh ivan Jokner uh, or Jokner from Ukraine. So thanks for making it. It's probably not easy to make it live streams from Ukraine. So we thank you for joining us and we hope you're well. Um, is there any chance to add in the future update? Click on empty space cursor position on all editors. Huge thanks. Okay, so let's jump to um, just jump over here to this project. Okay, so if we're in, I'll just copy some different parts here.
Okay, so let's say we're in the editor and here we have some empty space. So I think it's just going to be, um, it's just, so all you have to do is control. And if it's going to be, let's check my preference for under transport. Um, so locate when clicked in empty space doesn't seem to work there, but hold down um, it's alt and shift and then you can click anywhere you want even in an empty space in the editor so let's say while we're playing so alt shift and then you can click the locator playhead position anywhere you want so an empty space or on a note so try alt I'm sorry, Alt or Option plus the letter sh plus Shift, and then click, and that should work in the editors as well as on the project window. Let's see, Cap Tenergy Music just asking Michael Teens if he's lived in Texas all of his life. Sounds like a great conversation for the Zoom meetup on Friday. All right, so we see um, about to comment on a constrained delay compensation for MIDI latency um, fixed the problem. So it was the plugins that were t totally adding the latency. So yeah. All right, glad that solved, solved the issue for you. Now you got to hit the like button, all right. All right, uh, we see Gareth has made it from Spain. So thank you for joining us. Hope you're well. Um, so we see from Johnny, uh, is it side? Uh, hi Greg, just upgraded to a Mac Mini Pro and loading the Steinberg software back onto it. Uh, can't find the Grand SE. Is it discontinued? Um, yeah, it's been discontinued. Maybe 12 or maybe, maybe 15 plus years. So there's the Grand that will work. Um, <clears throat> and if you just got a Mac Mini Pro. The Grand SE was based on a 32-bit. It was a 32-bit plug-in, I believe. But there is the Grand that's available. Um, but also check out, like you know, within Cubase, there's some great plugins like the S90 ES Piano is um, is a really nice piano to work from. But uh, you know, the Grand is updated to work on the current Macs. Um, but yeah, it's probably been 15 plus years since the Grand SE. So, all right. So we see from uh, Pat Matt. Uh, can you colorize a set of selected parts with following colors? Project level logical editor increment colors for all with default macro, but I want each part. To be different having uh following colors thanks all right let's see if we can try it okay so we'll i'll just set up a project here with some tracks and we'll colorize them all the same to start with Okay, so we want to increment, uh, just make sure. So I'm not sure if it's, we'll try events and then tracks. Okay, so let's come over here to our project logical editor, set up. Uh, So 
on transform. We'll say we want to media type is equal to track. So we'll say our container type is equal to track and we want to set color. Okay, so let's say we want to, so that would allow us to select all the same colors to change. Okay, now let's say I want to do it on the property is set to uh, a track is selected. All right, so now if I come here, we could increment. Okay, so let me just go back. I'll make all of these the same color again. Okay, so let's say I have this one selected and then I want to navigate down. Let's see if we could just set this up. So that will Okay, so if we I'm just seeing if we could So if we do this, we'll say we're going to increment each one. That's going to just increment all to the same value. But let's see if we could um, Okay, I'm going to save this as a preset. Let's see if we could maybe we might have to do two logical editor presets. Um, but let's see if we can. So I'm just seeing if I could select all of these tracks, change it. Um, all right, let me just try this. Maybe we can do an invert selection.
All right, so I think I'm just saying if I could take this and let, let me see if we could do it. Um, I may have to play around with this a little more and I can show it on Friday's live stream, but I think what I was trying to do is to take this track selection and then let's see if nothing is selected. If we come over here to select. And invert the selection with Let's see. I'll take a quick stab and see if we can do parts because I think it's what the original question was. All right, so say equal to event. Oh, let me just. Try one more thing. All right, so let's try with the events here. So if we wanted all these to go, we'll give this a shot. All right, so let's try. And we may have to kind of build this as a a multi-step one as well. So, all right, so if we have this and we're going to have this selected, down here so let's all right we'll just give it another minute here see if I can all right so we're going to take Take events and colorize them that way. Start having a brain cramp. All right, so. I'll try to I'll I'll try to figure it out for Friday's live stream, but I think we sh I should be able to. It seems like this should change. Um and I'll just say property is set to is selected and then we should change that to color one and let's say if I do track that's selected it should change that to red so maybe Okay, maybe we'll just take this and see. I'll play around with it some more and see. So let, but let me know if you want it to be like each track to be a different color or events going along horizontally 
to all be different colors and that would be helpful I don't I'll try to have it figured out for Friday sorry about that all right wonderful to see Mark Rabin and his dog Stella who just went swimming sounds good thanks for Mark to join us from Montana See, Gareth is recommending not to buy Dell. So, all right. So we see. Uh, a question from Patrick Mandeville. A, uh, Greg, is there a way I can see the notes while I use the line tool? Uh, simply control drag on key editor while I play is not showing. Uh, it's kind of unknown what's to come. All right, so let's take a look in the key editor. Okay, so I'll make it full screen here. Um, so if you use the line tool, so let's say, okay, I'm gonna just grab the line tool here. Um, so you see that as I do that, it's just gonna go chromatically up. So if I just grab the line tool here, you know, whatever pitch, I can see what pitch is indicated um, on the left hand side of the keyboard so if I want to go chromatically from C over we could just do that now if we wanted this to uh, automatically go to particular keys we could go to the scale assistant here and we could say okay let's go to the scale assistant and I want this to be in D major and we could choose to uh, filter notes where you say show only notes that are in D major and now as I drag it across everything is going to be in D major automatically and then if I wanted to just now come over here and see chromatically uh, we can see that we're going to skip particular notes that are out of key um, so you know just know that when you start the particular note here you know that it's just going to go chromatically up and you could see where you stop if you see like so if I want it to be exactly from you know particular notes I could say okay I want this going from C2 and as I move it across you can say I want it to go to C4 and then that's two octaves chromatically and if I wanted that to can you know to go directly to the scale assistant we could just draw in um, you know pick your scale so again we'll go to our scale assistant say we want it to be in D and then I would say okay we can see all right here's D1 we have our line tool set and I want to start at D1 you know with with the line tool so you see exactly what pitch you're starting on and I want to get you know to go you know three octaves or whatever and have it all be directly in scale just like that so you know just look where the tool is you'll see the line as it moves it will indicate the pitch right there so let me know if that's helpful for you Patrick See that Gareth apparently has been locked out of some BIOS features on his Dell. So that's a bummer. 
It's your laptop, right? Yeah. Okay. Just read through comments. All right, uh, so we see from Pat Matt, um, is it possible to force Cubase to deselect parts when clicking on a track? Because every time I want to colorize a track, I colorize the last selected part instead of first. Um, thanks for all your answers. So, you know, it's not, you know, I think it's a, it could be kind of a nasty thing. You know, let's say we have lots of, you know, different events. Um, you know, it's if you when you if you wanted these events to be selected, I think selecting a track shouldn't affect that because you may be doing editing on that particular thing. Um, what you can do if you wanted to say, okay, I want to come over here and colorize this track, and you go to use the color tool, and what's going to happen is the events will get colorized and not the track because the events will have the priority. So if that's the case, what you could do is just click in a blank space um, and there's also if you go to edit there is a select none command so if you just want to you know you, you could assign a keyboard shortcut to select none and so if you have parts selected here um, you know you could make a macro and just come over here and say okay I want to select no events and then the track selection will have priority but you know you may be in a midi key editor and looking at all this and you still want to have those events selected uh, while you know you want to change a track color um, at the same time so you know try to select none or just click on an empty space if you want to colorize the tracks All right, wonderful to see Tiago checking in from Brazil. Glad you can make it. All right, so just see a comment um, from Abdurov. Uh, it says, bless you, Greg, wonderful tips and tricks. So thank you for the kind words. I'm sorry, I'm sure I mispronounced your name. My apologies. Okay, so DL White uh, just uh, asks, can you explain technically the threshold on hit points? Uh, I have timing issues with different with different threshold setting. We'll quantize, fix it afterwards. Um, all right, so let's come over and uh, let's just go to project that will be appropriate for this. Okay, so let's say we have our um, our kick drum track, or let's say our snare track here. Snares are always good during the middle of the kit. All right, so we'll come over, and as we're listening to our snare, so we'll go to snare. You hear the kick, you hear the hi-hats, you'll hear toms. So there's a kick and hi hat. So we hear snare now. And we'll see parts when there's not going to be really snares. So as we do this, we're going to hear snare. We'll kind of cut out, but we still hear kick and hi hat and toms bleeding through. So if I was to do like a replacement of the snare, I don't want the snare to be firing off every time it's hearing bleed from the kick or snare, the kick or hi-hat. So when we go to our samples, you know, we want, and we go to the hit point, so we go to the sample editor, we could adjust the threshold, and we can see, and we can think of this kind of like a virtual noise gate, so we can say, okay, there's a snare hit here.
and this way it's only going to find parts of where the snare is so if i do a you know a hip point i'll just erase this part and we'll select this track if i do a hit point here and we'll say sorry and as we come we'll say let's make our snare hit so we'll go to make midi notes we're going to put on the first selected track and we want it to be on d1 and we'll hit okay so now as we do this it's only going to basically be playing where the snare came in but if i did let's say new track version and I adjust this threshold without any sensitivity. Anything that has any little transient will get picked up. So we'll now again create a MIDI note and we'll retain our dynamic velocities. All right, so now as we listen to our snare, So anything that was there before so that's without the threshold so let's say we'll solo we'll just mute our snares here so we can hear that our sample snare with the threshold and our sample snare without the threshold. So that's why, why the threshold is useful because it's really picking up kind of the parts that are the intended snares as opposed to everything that's leading, kind of bleeding into the tracks, which is pretty typical with like a, a live drum recording. So. All right, we see Michael Teams has granted my family and myself one gallon of pina colada ice cream. Sounds great. About ready to get up to 98, I think, on Friday here. So, but thank you. My son will love it. Nick is looking for spare hours in a day in case anyone has some to offer. All right, so we see a uh, question from Martin. Uh, it says, Cloner, where to find? Um, so Cloner will be just a plugin that's gonna be on, uh, you're gonna find it in a modulation category. So let's say if we jump to this project. And I'll revert it, because I'm sure I've destroyed this. And what Cloner is like really good at is like if you have background vocals, you want them to sound thicker, like or vocal doubling. So if it's this Cloner plugin, we'll show you. What did you say? You wish so an effects channel track. And, and under. So we'll go to modulation. So now we take our lead vocal here. Let's do that. You wished it all away, and I'm left you for a thousand years and a day. So we could just kind of make that vocal sound a little thicker and wider. It's like a vocal doubler. So 
the four voices I've always found to be. So you can take each voice and have different amounts of little bit of delay, slight detuning. Especially effective on background vocals. So kind of very center focus, you know. So great little plug-in. So if you haven't experimented with that, it's a great one to go play with. All right, so we see uh, X Cubase X joining. So glad you can make it today. All right, so my chat field just jumped. All right, so we see, will someone beat me to creation of a hit song? I wish you well, so. Um, okay, so Patrick Mandeville A ask, uh, Greg, uh, it's, it's a doubt in what kind of situations composer use, MIDI logical editor to actually use. I wondered what you've encountered. So yeah, I mean, lots of MIDI logical editor presets. I mean, if you look at a lot of, you know, composers that are, you know, when they have touch screens, they're just firing off different presets. You know, like if you look at Hans Zimmer's and he's kind of the prototype for a lot of that uh, workflow, a lot of those are just firing off, you know, MIDI logical editor presets, like take every other note, increase velocity by you know 20 decrease velocity decrease the third note randomize the velocities of this randomized positions and randomized velocity so very heavily used by composers just to come up with really interesting different variations fast you know All right, so uh, we have a question from Value. It says, uh, Greg, question, the colors of my meters are not changeable. How can I solve that? Cubase Pro 12, Windows 11, newest version. Uh, it's maybe the NVIDIA driver. So, you know, one of the things that is a little confusing uh, that people run into a lot is each of the meter types, there's multiple meter types. Um, so let's say we're playing this and we're looking at our meters and we go to our preferences and we go to event display meters or we go to meters and appearance so make sure that when you're doing this you know each meter type can have its own default so now i'm going to put this on my channel meters so if i say okay i want this to be very red like orange at this point So I can move this down and say, okay, at this point, I want it to be, so I have that now when I hit apply, you can see that the meter color has changed. But if you have it set for digital, uh, you know, DYN, these are meters that often show up in the meter pane. But make sure that if you want it for this, for the channel meter, or if you have it for if you're adjusting this 
for a digital scale. So let's say if I go to my meter, we say, oh, this meter isn't changed. And right now it's set to digital scale. So I would select digital scale and then So now as I bring this down and hit apply, we can see that that will now change. So make sure that you have the right, that you're adjusting the right meter in for the preferences here. So let me know if that helps. All right, so we see from DL White says, that's it, alt glue. Thanks a lot, Greg. Okay, Gareth advises on world peace by whacking the like button. So sounds, sounds like a worthy investment. All right, so we see from Plastic People Records and ah, merge, alt, and glue, huge. The more you know, the great info. That nugget's going to be a huge saver for them, so that's great. All right, so we see uh, from value, whose question is, uh, when mixing a binaural frequency uh, with left-right difference of one to two kil one to two hertz, it seems the signal in Cubase itself is resonating. Um, is there a way to record that? So anything that you change, and this, I think that this would um, carry over. If it's routed, you know, it could be trickier with, um, binaural, um, but we'll, we'll give it a shot and see. All right, so you may be hearing like phasing, you know, as you're kind of panning around in binaural. Um, I think I may have a quick project. see if it's let me see if it's under my tutorials because I just did a tutorial on this let's post it See if it's look one other place and that I'll just make it up again. Just look. Let's see if I All right, I'll just make up a new project with this. Sorry about that. Thought I had one that's kind of set up. Yep, I think 
this might be the project here. Yeah, sorry. Okay, so let's say we want to take um, all right so we'll set this up for binaural so we'll go over here and do just idiom authoring for Dolby Atmos get to our setup assistant okay we're gonna monitor binaurally Headphones on, should right hear that. Just kind of spinning around the room. All right, so let's say this is going to, you may have to go to, um, so I have a stereo output in my VST connections. Um, so let's go to this track. You could try this. Um, let's get to our standard bed track. And I'm going to send this. Let's see if we could add an effects channel. Uh, not what I want. Let's see if we could create a stereo group. I'm not sure if you want it to be in stereo or not, but we'll give it a try. So add a group channel, stereo. Okay, and on our renderer, on our bed channel, let's see if we could route this to our stereo group. And let's create an audio track. And we'll make this stereo group as its input. So it looks like, you know, so maybe try that. So take the bed channel, the standard bed, create a stereo group. And on the aux sends of the bed, um, once you're here, route to the stereo group and then route that, create an audio track and record the input of the stereo group and see if that does what you want value. It's great to see value from Vienna. All right, so we see Michelle, um, how do I get my metronome on beat? Um, so generally, you know, the metronome will, you know, always be on beat here. So I'm not sure if you're using, you know, this the standard click track. But if we kind of look at the measures here, so we can see like the measures in each of the beats. And when you work with the metronome, so let's say if we add a signature track, so right click and add a signature track, um, you know, by default, it usually is going to be set to 4-4, four, four, but you could, you know, select the 4-4 four, four here and see if you see, have a different click pattern. But, you know, if we just kind of look at the grid here, so where each of these lines will be the beat. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it looks, it's, I've never had an issue with the metronome being off. Also go to the, your transport. And if you go to the metronome setup, um, you know, if you're, I'm not sure if you're doing MIDI metronomes, but you could just always activate the metronome click and you could choose just to use, you know, if you have like a clock destination, maybe you could, or your click destination rather, you could, you know, maybe make sure it's not set to MIDI because MIDI could be going through other plugins that could impose latency and just see if you have the audio click checked if you still have the same issues. All right, we see from Gerald Ely says, yes, Greg, that's what I wanted. Uh, thank you, so you're welcome. through comments. Thanks for all the great comments. See Michael Teams indicating that Sable has some nice gadgets. She does. We're all gadget envy of Sable. Um, all right, so we see uh from rm uh i use volume for automation hence it is first in the list uh, in the later stage i would like to use volume in mixer to rebalance the volume of tracks uh, is there a plugin which has the same volume span so it's it is the same volume control if i'm understanding correctly so let's say if we um do something less ambisonic So if I take this particular track here, this vocal, um, so let's say if I'm automating, so let's say I have my volume here in the automation. So let's say I have those volume changes. So as we do this, you could watch that these changes automatically follow the same So if I make this all like super tall here, this will be the same exact automation. So if I wanted to write the automation, so whatever I, whether I draw it in, this is kind of just a graphical representation of the motion of this particular uh, fader. So, and vice versa, so, you know, that way we could just, um, they're kind of one in the same, but let me know if I'm misunderstanding. So, so I would like to use a volume in a mixer to rebalance the volume tracks. Um, so I, I don't think you need a plug-in for that because the, if you're drawing in automation initially from here, the mixer is following that and you could just, you know, change that particular automation. So let's say even if you're here, just touch it. Hold on to the mouse, keep your left mouse button down and release. It'll go back to the existing automation. So we'll see an automation jump coming up here. And if I draw in here, we'll see that it'll get, the fader is gonna reflect this change. But let me know, RM, if I'm misunderstanding. All right, and we see um, 
maybe just a continuation uh, so this original part the first part was I use volume for automation hence it is first on the list so I'm assuming it's this list here um, uh, in a later stage I would like to use volume in mixer to rebalance the volume of tracks is there a plugin which has the same volume span and so I can copy over the automation to its respective automation track and free the volume fader. So yeah, let me know if that is, you know, because it is, you know, the two are kind of intrinsically linked together for functionality. So, but let me know if that makes sense. Okay, so we see from RB World Music, uh, what is the best way to quantize percussion instruments without it sounding bad? Um, should I only use slice mode? So it could really depend, you know, if you're doing more kind of like drum stuff, like let's say like maybe a multi-track drum stuff, you know, the slicing um, at the transients will tend to work well. Sometimes you can just you know, quantized normally, it's always going to be kind of based upon the transients. So, but, you know, you if you're doing kind of a, a more of a multi-track drum quantizing and let's say like the fills were speeding up and slowing down pretty consistently, you know. So I'll revert to this. So let's say if we listen to our drums, I, I, I've placed all my drums into a folder, so and that's always helpful. And we turn on our click. I think there's a fill here. And that fill kind of sped up, you know. So, um, you know, here you could find, you know, the hit points for, you know, the thresholds that we get the hit points correctly for like let's say kick and snare so again adjust threshold in this case we want to do hi-hat as well um, and then you know we could you know place them in place all the tracks into a folder we could enable group editing and then go to the quantize and we want to kind of set priority so our kick has highest priority snare followed by hi-hat um, and now that all those events are selected at this point we could choose you know kind of different methods for the quantize so you know we could say okay i want so we could choose to do you know audio warp or slices so if audio warp is set we could take those and it will kind of just you know do time stretching or we could choose to do slices so we'll come over we're going to when audio warp is deactivated we click on slices it's now gone through and sliced as then we're going to set our grid here to 16th notes uh, and we want to now take each of these little slices here um, and then we could apply the quantize and that could shift the different timing of the individual elements and at times this could leave gaps and at that point we just want to cross fade all of those different gaps and so as we listen to it So either method will work. You can hear how tighter that snare roll was. Um, so, but you could do slices or hit points. So I tend to do like audio quantize on individual tracks and I want kind of more like a multi-track. I may ten to slices but you know sometimes either way either method could work
All right, so we see uh, I'm new to this, just trying to figure out uh, which, uh, I guess, which DAW to use. I just downloaded Ableton 11. Is Cubase 11 similar? Is Cubase similar? So I think Cubase, um, you know, I think Ableton, I don't, I've never really worked with it, but, you know, it seems like a lot of programs may predispose you, like you may have, it may lead you to work particular ways whereas cubase i think is going to be a much broader program that allows you to do more different types of work more different types of projects and we also have these live streams twice a week it says uh, i'm using guitar effects pedals midi keyboard audio interface uh hologram microcosm and a little canto kalimba so if you're doing a lot of audio stuff and maybe you're, you know, doing guitar stuff, I think Cubase is probably going to be uh, probably a more a, a more comprehensive tool, like it has better solutions where, you know, and maybe if you were, you know, because some programs may force you to kind of work like for EDM stuff. And if you're not doing that or you don't want to be kind of bound by or to have particular workflows imposed on you, then I think Cubase would be a better solution. Okay, so we have a question from Mark Rabin. Um, he just says, uh, got a question, got my MIDI controller, Kai MPC uh, 225, it's in the list now, thanks. Uh, when I use transport controls on keyboard, the reverse does nothing, so I need to set to return to stop. It also does not work. Um, so I'll just take a look. I don't have that particular controller, uh, but if I wanted to, you know, see one is you can see there's, you know, there may be different mapping pages, but you could just double click on a particular function. So if I wanted this to you know, return to zero, I could, you know, instead of record, uh, at this point, like we have this set to, um, I could just come right here in the MIDI remote map. So we could say return to start position, and then we could apply the mapping for that particular key. So you should be able to kind of remap it like that. So let me know if for instance, you didn't, um, you know, if you have a different function that's been remapped, and sometimes you may just, you know, come over here and if you go to the mapping page here, um, so let's go, I'm sorry, let's just, we'll double click on a parameter here, uh, and then you could click on plus and you could just create a new mapping page if you wanted to experiment and still leave all like, you know, there's like four or five mapping pages and these are other ones that I've created as well. So maybe see if you do a new mapping page, that way you don't affect what the factory one is, but there may be other factory ones available as well just by clipping, clicking in the mapping page field. All right, so we see from uh, Sable Winters, uh, if I get a rainbowed out uh, track from Spectral Layers Pro on a stemmed out render, am I in trouble cleaning it up? Generally not. So when you have kind of like a rainbowed uh, where you have kind of multiple colors, it's basically each layer is a different color. So like the drums may be one color, the vocals are different, the bass, guitar, keyboards, other um, will all kind of show up as different colors. All right, great to see Michael Pierce. He's made it back on. And always wonderful to see Randy Lee from Texas. Glad you make it today.
All right, wonderful to see uh, Joe from Rochester. So great to see you, glad you can make it today. Um, and he says, can you go over the auto fades function? Uh, is there a way to visually see the fades on the way from uh, when on a waveform when using the auto fades function? Thank you. So when you do the auto fades function, and I'll just go back a couple steps here. Uh, if we have done, let's say I have all sorts of edits that are going on and maybe I make an edit in the middle of a waveform here and like we may hear like a click or pop because we've made an edit. So where you, what the auto fades function will allow you to do is just to any time that an audio clip starts or ends or intersects with another audio clip, it will just do a quick short fade in, fade out, or cross fade. Now they're not visually there. So it's going to just do it on playback automatically. So a lot of people will spend, you know, countless hours cleaning up like, you know, extensive edits to do, you know, to put like, you know, 400 fade ins and fade outs on different audio clips. And that's not really necessary because this will kind of take care of the function for you audibly, which is the most important thing. But it doesn't actually, it's not editable other than the amount of time and the fade shape, but it's not visible on the actual project itself. So if you wanted to see it visually, then that would be like a fade in that we would write on, like into the event, um, as opposed to just uh, an auto fade so you know and often the auto fade you just can turn it on and not have to worry about having to do hundreds of little fade ins and fade outs along the way and that's kind of the intention of it All right, so see Mark Raven just saying thanks, Greg, for helping us all. So just thank you all for the wonderful questions. All right, you see Peter has to check, uh, has to take off. So thanks for joining us, Peter. Hopefully we'll see you on Friday's Zoom meetup. Sorry, my chat field jumped on me. Let me see. Just reading through some comments here. All right, so you see value just says, uh, thanks, Greg. Unfortunately, it didn't help because it doesn't save the settings I take in the preferences. Um, and I think this is my bin with the um, with the meter colors. So, you know, make sure that once you do the meter colors here, so let's say I do this, um, so let's say you move it down, that you hit apply first. So without hitting apply, then it, you know, you may make the change, but make sure that you hit apply first, and then that will kick the particular uh, preference in. So if you don't hit apply, and you just kind of hit OK, it may not take. But you know, you saw me
do it. Hopefully that will give you confidence at work. I just did it on my PC over the weekend. All right, so great to see Michael Marshall checking in from Somerset, UK. All right, you can see value just saying the trick uh, routing to bed will work just fine. Thanks from Vienna. So, yeah, let me know if that does a trick. Lots of discussion on laptops. It's Gareth Adele stopped the ability for him to overclock. It's kind of a bummer. Sorry that happened to you. Still reading through comments, lots of discussion on laptops. All right, so I think we're um, going to get some questions that were sent in. So let me get to some of the questions that were sent in before it gets too late. Thanks for all the wonderful questions from everyone. All right, uh, so we had a question this is from the last live stream of how to lock the outputs for Groove Agent. So let's go ahead and take a look. Um, so if we did different routing, um, so let's come over to this project. Okay, so if we have done routing, where let's say we open up and it's, it's, it is slightly different for beat agent and um, acoustic agent kits. So if you have beat agent, let's go ahead and we'll look at our mix console here and we'll open up a beat agent kit. And as we play, sorry, I'll turn it. Sorry about waking everyone up. Okay, so let me just get my control room way down. All right, so now. All right, so let's say I want to take, take this particular kit here and I wanted to take the kick so let's say I have Oops. let me just I'm gonna revert the project here, sorry. Okay, destroyed it really good. I'll make it more amenable audio wise here. Okay. So we will take we'll start with our uh Beat Agent Kit, so we'll open this up and all 
All right, so I'm gonna go to my instrument pad here. So let's say I wanna take this kick and we see that this is all going out of one stereo output. So I'm gonna select the kick and let's send it to bus two. So now when we solo this track, it's only the kick. So there is a little padlock and this is kind of what I was looking for before and we could lock the outputs. So if I load up a different kit, I could say, let's load up uh, a kit with patterns. I could say, let's grab this one, that the kick is still locked to the particular output here. Or the pad is. So you could lock the colors or lock the outputs. So depending on your kit, so if I wanted to go to another kit, this particular pad would automatically uh, be locked to the outputs. Now it's gonna be slightly different on, uh, on an acoustic agent kit, which is what I think the original one was. So I'll just stop that and let's come over to an acoustic agent kit like we have in this track. All right, so now if I come here with the acoustic agent, I'm generally not, you know, and I have, let's say my snare going out of output two. So I'm gonna come over here and we'll say a snare is out of output too. So with the acoustic agent, what you could do is just, I'm gonna try just to load the patterns only. So when I come over here, we could just say, let's go to styles. And I want this to be, um, let's choose maybe like kind of funk. And as I come, I could say, let's go to like a disco funk. Let's see if it let me just not select any of the patterns here. So as I go to different patterns here, that now I could as I load up different patterns that this particular output will still be retained. So this output too, some of the sounds you know, may not match and we're kind of have some different, let me just find like a hard rock kit. So, but we see that as we load up different styles at these particular sounds are still there and preserved. So in acoustic agents, you may want to, you know, just load up different styles and then, but, and then that will preserve the output routing. So, all right. So, and we had another question um, is how to flip like the left and right channels. on an acoustic agent kit. So we'll come over. And let's say we wanted to switch from like audience perspective to drummer's perspective. So let's say we have So we could see kind of hear the toms in the panning process here. All right, so if we wanted to flip that, let's go over to the kit mixer. Um, click on kit mix and then you have left, right. And we could flip that from audience perspective to kind of drummer's perspective. So let's come over here.
so now if I wanted to go to my different Tom pads, and if we flip this again, So that way we could switch. The different panning perspectives just on the acoustic agent kit. All right, um, so we see question. Uh, Hi, Greg, uh, can I save the instrument track as preset with contact instance with 16 outputs and 15 MIDI tracks and load them whenever I want into my project window and route automatically? Uh, if this feature is not available, please make it available on the next version. I would like it to be used for, it would be useful for film score composers. Also, it'd be great if we could add a folder and group track. Um, this means creating a folder track and all VST instruments and multi-out MIDI tracks are routed to group tracks. Thanks. So it's not, you know, a track preset um, is is not preserved the routing because we want the track preset to be utilized in any project regardless and independent of the routing. So if you have a particular, um, you know, multi-out instrument, uh, what you could do, and we'll just do a new project here. So if I have a multi-out instrument and we have, you know, Alan Silvestri, you know, one of the greatest film composers, works this way all the time. So let's say he has a Halion, we'll do, just do Halion Sonic, and he has multiple tracks that as he loads them up here, Just double click and let's say, okay, we come here to this instrument and these are all have different outputs. Okay, so we'll come over to the mixer. We'll route these to our different outs and let's route these to a group. And if we wanted to also, we'll call this, you know, strings or whatever group that you want. Um, and if we want it to also include the an effects channel, we could come right over here and say, okay, let's add reverb. Okay, so instead of a track preset, all you have to do is just export selected tracks. And we could reference MIDI fi media files or not. And we'll say, okay, this is, you know, preset strings. And I will just... So again, export selected tracks. I'm going to just check where I see. Okay. So now that I remove all these tracks, so I have the routing all done. All you have to do is I'll remove all these tracks and we export the selected tracks and we import a track archive. So we'll go to the desktop and go to preset strings and all the routing we'll just choose to select all and then all of the tracks will now get imported with all of their routing so that's how you could save kind of presets that way and one of the things that you could do and you, know, you mentioned about you know group tracks and folder tracks so realize that our folder tracks can have many different types of data that don't pass audio. So it's really more designed as an intention, um, you know, for more organization purposes. But there is a built-in macro, and don't be intimidated by my macro list when you come here, because uh, mine is larger than probably anyone's. Um, uh, but there is a macro called selected tracks to new folder and add group channel. So say, okay, I want this to be percussion and hit okay. And now they're all placed into a folder and the group track has uh, been created just like that. So 
if you wanted to do that, you can, but realize that folder tracks aren't limited to passing audio. It could be a video track, could be, you know, all sorts of different things. All right, so a question. Um, sometimes I want to uh, analyze a WAV file from the media folder, right zone, and show up in the RMS level or loudness meters in control room, but I haven't found any way or have I missed something? Um, Okay, so I didn't find a, a good way of doing this. So when we, you know, if I take the control room here from the studio menu and we go to control room, just default, and if we preview that we could see kind of the meters to give you a good idea. Um, but if I switch to the meter tab, it's not showing, you know, I don't think it's playing until it's actually seeing meters. So, but if I just kind of click here on a control room, I could get an idea of meters, but I think it has to kind of be, you know, this metering stage is more contingent upon like this level. So let's say if we go to our control room, um, you know, so let's say if we adjust here and we have the control room, level down that's going to be contingent upon what we see in the metering and not really reflected so i think it's going to tie more into once it's in the project and then you could even come over and do like an audio statistics uh if you need to find out like you know the different levels uh of files that are imported so sorry it doesn't reflect it because it's not part of the project yet um, so question, hello, uh, I use a, a ranger track quite a lot. It's very useful, but I always have difficulty with the alignment of finished sections. Um, let me explain when I'm setting up my ranger parts and playing the arrange meant everything sounds great. However, after I flatten the track, it doesn't sound the same. There's notes missing, unexpected jumps, all sorts of problems that weren't there before. So then I have to go back to the original pre-flattening track and tidy up the small imperfections of note placement a bit, placement of the ranger track, start finish markers, and then flatten again. Um, do you have any tips or settings that you could pass on to ensure everything is aligned properly? So it, when you're doing kind of the arranger track, if you've specified that it's going to be like, you know, the arranger track is going to be from you know, measure four through seven for this arranger chain event. You know, you just have to, like, as you add the particular events here, so let's say, you know, this is where you want the arranger track to start, you know, just take a look. And even if you just look at all the editors and just see if there's data that's hanging over. So if we have events that are here, and I'll just turn my snap on and then we jump to here to there um, if the event starts you know before section before this defined range of time is then you may miss the beginning note when it's kind of out of sequence so it may sound fine when you play it linearly but it's just kind of the nature of working with the arranger track that, you know, to make sure that the start of the events is within the time range of the particular arranger track. And it could be just simple quantizing just notes on beat one. You don't have to necessarily change the feel, but even if you just say, okay, I want to, you know, quantize everything uh, just on beat one for you know globally so if you hold down like you know control shift um or command command shift and i just want to quantize the notes within this particular range uh and just do it you know even for one downbeat that will help with the transitions all right i think this um it says, I'm convinced I'm one click away from Bliss, but can't find a video which explains a great feature in Groove Agent 5, not SE. I remember when a presenter explaining how to select all the patterns in Acoustic Agent and copying them with a single instrument track. Um, so in basically his question is how to do it, all patterns. Um, and I think, you know, what this may be, John, is not 
um, that all patterns are being carried over. But let's come over to, um, and I think it's from John Costigan, if memory serves. But we'll do the full groove agent. In the full groove agent, we could have multiple agents. So I could have one pattern on this agent, a different pattern in this agent. Sorry. Okay, so now we could take a look and we have different agents. And at this point, if we go into our pattern editor and then there's, um, so we'll go to our overview that, and if we just come over to So now we could drag like these patterns, you know, together, I think so. so let me just find uh, the right one. So let's say, okay, I want to take, see now both of these patterns are playing and we could drag in you know, those patterns. Um, and then we could have like the same patterns going across the four, the four different ones, but it's not, I don't think it's every pattern, like all 16 patterns to drag in. So it's going to take one event, but it could drag. And I think if you activate uh, the global pad settings here that you could copy these four of the same patterns over. So we can see that we copied multiple patterns over that way. So let me know if that makes sense. All right, um, so we have a um, um, question from Belgium, um, a question concerning track names inherited from part event names. So I know we could do the opposite in preferences, move an audio file to a track and it inherits the track name. Uh, but I would really like useful times here to have a preference to do the opposite. A case example, I have a mixing template set up, effect sends preloaded, routing of every track and subgroup set up, ready to go. I might have generic names on empty audio tracks like synth one, synth two. I might have 40 tracks I'm importing and I have to go through and manually rename each track to reflect the part. Uh, I would like to have the track names refer um, specifically to the audio file name. Having an option for the track name to be inherited from an audio part that is on it would be very helpful automatically for global manual toggle. Thanks for your reply. Yeah, so I think what happens with the naming is like if I take this particular, you know, tech house base loop and I double click and we add it, that that name is automatically kind of carried over uh, right into the track name. And if I import an audio file, so let's say, okay, I want to do eight nervous, that it's going to import and carry the name over. But if you're working uh, with like a template, which what it sounds like you're doing, um, you know, it, you know, it's not going to necessarily carry, you know, when you drop it onto a track with an existing name, I don't know of a way to automatically kind of, you know, copy this name, you know, and paste, you know, so let's say this is that track name other than, you know, just kind of coming over here, copying and pasting. I'll see if I can make a macro to do it, but there's no kind of preference because the intention is that you would get the name as the file is imported but if you're working with a template that may not carry over as well um, but I'll all right so next well, I'll see if I could get a, a macro or something set up um, so we see uh, hi Greg, I have an Audient ID4 interface with updated drivers and when clicking in the studio setup, Audient driver control panel, nothing happens. Uh, I know that a window showing buffer size and sample rates should appear. Do you know how to solve this? 
If clicking on Windows, if clicking in Windows, audience tray icon appears, app is shown is correct. Um, so when that's happening, you know, we go to your studio to studio setup. At this point, you go to the control panel. Not every single audio interface allows us to communicate with the particular, uh, you know, with the particular control panel. So I think famously for years, I haven't used one in forever or, or had any experience with any, but the Motu interfaces were kind of notorious for not uh, doing that. But if it gets, if you go down to your tray, your system tray and access it, it'll get you to the same thing, but it, it would be a limitation of the audience driver not responding to the call to the control panel. So 99% of audio interfaces do it, um, but it's not a requirement for the audio interface. All right, and we had a big question about uh, from Sven Isaacson, and may not have time to go into it fully today. I'll try to respond by email um, about audio connections kind of getting uh, scrambled with different settings. So one of the things to check, Sven, if you could let me know if you're having the particular audio settings from, um, you know, because audio, the audio connections can be set from each particular project. So if you're going from project to project, each project may have different inputs and outputs. So if I go to, let's say this project, um, and I'll just go to another quick project, but let me know if it's actually changing on the actual within the same project, or when you go to a different project, if the audio connections are preserved. So you see that when I switched to a different project, I have different inputs for different projects. Um, so I go over here, this would be my friend Vince's IO routing. So let me know if it's changing uh, within the same project or if it's just changing um, because each project can have different inputs and outputs. All right, so with that, we're just we're just about out of time. Um, and we may have one more question. I know Michael Pierce had one. I'll try to respond to him by email. But we want to thank everyone for all the wonderful questions. And we look forward to seeing some new people joining us for the Zoom meetup uh, on Friday, starting at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern. So we'll do about two hours of a uh, live stream and, and two or three hours of the Zoom meetup. I want to thank everyone for all the great questions. And if you have questions you want to send in advance, send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. And then we will uh, look forward to seeing everyone back on Friday. Everyone stay safe and healthy. And we'll goodbye.